Connect family, uh, PD here. As I always say, I'm in my house, and you're in your house. I'm in God's house. You're in your house, but we're going to make it because of the word being presented, God's house, wherever we are. I hope that you are ready to receive today. We are in a series. Man, this is a doozy. We are in a series entitled One Blood. If you're with somebody, just turn to them and say, One Blood. Say, we one blood, okay? And so we are united by the blood of Jesus. Now, Acts 17 has been our theme text. We're reading from verse 26, and here's what it says. It says, and he has made, that's God, has made us from one blood. There's that, there's that word there, those two words. From one blood, every nation. Now, we learned in the first week of the series, we're in part three now. We learned in the first week of the series that this word nation refers to ethnos, people. So he has made from one blood, one man, one woman, uh, a people, every people, men of men, to dwell all over the face of the earth, and he has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwelling. He determined where you live, the location you live, the time and season you would live. He predetermined that, and that's actually, in some cases, it's an advantage. I think for me, it's an advantage. I'm glad I was born during this predetermined time within the boundaries of the United States of America. Come on, somebody. It's a little crazy right now, but I'm still grateful for that. So as I... um, get ready to get into today's topic. I want to review a little bit of last week with Pastor Devin, who did a fantastic job in the second part of our series. We learned a few things, a really few key, and there's so many things that he unpacked that were very principled. I think it's really important for us not to just have rules and and regulations and policies, but principles, because principles have flexibility to them. They help us with the dynamics of relationships. But he basically said, remember, though, it's about influence. And and, And it takes a lifetime, in a sense, to build years to build your influence, but you can lose it in a second. So we want to be really, really careful in how uh, we navigate a lot of our people interactions and a lot of our relationships. Another thing that we learned from Pastor Devin, we have to kind of adopt a different posture as believers, and that is, um, you know, is, is that we can disagree politically, but we must love unconditionally because God, his priority isn't politics, his priority is in fact people. (laughs) And then, excuse me, thirdly, uh, one of the things that I love that he said is we got to make sure that we put the cross of Jesus Christ above the flag. Now, I'm proud to be an American. I feel like singing a song there. I I definitely have a sense of nationalism, uh, and I believe in the democracy of our country, but theocracy trumps democracy. Uh, I'm a citizen of heaven uh, because of the blood of Jesus Christ before, even above my citizenship here on earth. And so I hope that you will uh, continue to look through Uh, the lens of these principles as we continue in our series. Now, in week one, um, I talked a little bit about, you know, really how the nations of the earth came to be uh, through uh, originally scattered because of the Tower of Babel, and I unpacked You should go back and check that out, what happened there, what God had to do there, where he ultimately restores it, or how he he has um, uh, planned to restore those things for us. Uh, um, Later you'll see, you know, through through the book of Genesis, how uh, the whole earth was destroyed with a flood, and then there were just basically eight people on a boat, and then once again, the people of God were scattered around the whole earth. But one of the things I wanted to encourage you was from something we can take from the book of Genesis, which I'll probably allude to a couple different times, but within this uh, text and many others like it, we can see throughout Scripture, as my daddy used to say, Scripture is replete with the notion. What a cool phrase. Uh, What does that mean? It just means it's a common thread throughout Scripture that unity is important to God. Come on, turn to your neighbor or write in the chat, unity, unity, unity is so important. Unity and diversity, those kind of things, are they can, they can be married together, one. In fact, Jesus, when he prayed his final prayer, in John chapter 17, he prayed, make us one. May they be one as you and I are one, is what Jesus was saying there. And so unity is clearly a big deal to God. Now, in the book of Psalms, there's a principle, uh, um, uh, really a blessing. a a favorable condition that is a byproduct of the people of God, believers, coming into unity. It's not the only place, but it's just one I'd like to highlight. It's Psalm 133. It's a great devotional. It says this. Read this with me. Um, It says, For brethren, 
you know, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together. Do you know you can be together but not necessarily dwell together? You can be in the same room, uh, inches apart but miles apart in your heart. God's telling us in Psalm 133 how good and how pleasant it is when brethren, believers, dwell together in unity. There's that word, unity. It's like the precious oil upon the head, running down on the beard, to the beard of Aaron, running down on the edge of his garments. In other words, this anointing attracts unity. And, and, and it, it, this, it's, it's, it, it just pulls it in. And then it says it's like the dew of Hermon, descending upon the mountains of Zion. And then it says something really profound that I wanted to, wanted to see pop for you. It says, for there, where, Pastor Derek? For there, where, everybody? For there, where there is unity, where people dwell together in unity, the Bible says the Lord commands a blessing. Come on, somebody. That'll preach. Where there is unity, the Lord commands a blessing. He will anoint and he will bless People who dwell, who live together, who interact with one another and all their differences and all their distinctives. And they come together as one in unity. And when they do, the Lord commands them. You know, when the Lord commanded something, the heavens and the earth were formed. Night and day was separated. The oceans were formed. The, the beasts of the field and the fowl of the air and, and all of create because he just commanded it. And so if you want to know the power of God, when he commands and something that happens. And so you can be blessed when we come together in unity. Every uh, meal in my house uh, since the children were very young, knee high to a grasshopper, uh, uh, they have had this, we have had this declaration that we always say. As soon as, the, as soon as we say our prayer, we conclude and say, as for me and my house, we will, we will, we will serve the Lord. That word we really popped uh, when I began to think about this declaration. See, a lot of times it's, it's me, myself, and I. I'll serve the Lord, but I'm not doing stuff with other people. I'm not going to dwell together with one another. God wants, uh, our house will be blessed, our businesses will be blessed, our families, our marriages, our church will be blessed when, when we serve the Lord together, when we come together as one. You know, when Jesus prayed in the, in the text that I, I referenced earlier in John 17, make us one Lord, he prayed that five times in that one text. It's important that there be a, a we factor and not so much a me factor. Even in the Lord's prayer, it starts with our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. It doesn't say my Father. It doesn't say that. It says our Father. There's a, there is a collective. There is a, a joining of one another. There is a coming together. Our Father. This is where that hour of power is. In. And Jesus is trying to remind us that we are, from the very beginning to the end of the Bible, we are one blood. We are one family. We are one nation under God. We are, as for me and my house, we are one household that serves the Lord. We must come under the Lord's leadership. And so I pray that he speak to you uh, by his spirit about the importance of us being united, that we focus on what we are, in a, we are united about, not on all the things that we differ about. And so Psalms reveals this powerful secret that, that, that there, in that place, there is in fact a blessing. And so where, that will happen with marriages, and that will happen with, with all aspects of life and family and businesses, and in particular, I'd like to say, uh, to our church. But we have to let go of the me, myself, and I. We have to stop that. You know, we used to sing this song when I was a, a, a young man. My dad, I can hear my daddy's voice saying he's sick now, so he, he can't even remember all the songs that he once did. But for a while there, when he was struggling with dementia, I could begin to sing songs, and, and he could pull those out. And he used to sing, let's forget about ourselves. Concentrate on him and worship him. Let's forget about ourselves concentrate on him and worship him let's forget about us I'm getting into it right now I've been singing this all afternoon in preparation for this song but the point is it's not about me we got to focus on him. We got to focus on we. We got to stop focusing on me. And that's what's created some of the problems. And when we make it about all of us, the people of God, dwelling together in unity, there, God commands a blessing. Surely you've, you've heard of the, 
the Pareto Principle. If you haven't heard of the Pareto Principle, you probably heard of the 80-20 rule, where in essence, basically what happens there is basically 20% of the people are doing 80% of whatever is necessary. And, and, and 80% are just kind of sitting back and taking it all in or doing nothing or whatever. And, and it's that 20% in the local church, for example, that are serving, that are leading, that are discipling, that are giving. And the 80% are receiving and they're receiving and they're receiving. What if that could be reversed? What if 80% were all in? What if 80% were fully dedicated? What if 80% were dwelling together in unity, one voice, you know, one language, one purpose, one blood, one family? What would happen? I think that people would come to church and, and they would come into small groups and they would come into relationship with you and they would look around and think, man, these people are on fire for God. These people are all in. These people are totally dedicated. Like, I need to get, I need to get going going like I need to get a part of this like I I'm missing out that's what would happen it would overwhelm people and I want you to see the incentive by the spirit of God for being united in Acts, the book of Acts, we see a profound example of this. Uh, we see it wrong, a, a, a selfish ambition in the book of Genesis in chapter 11 at the Tower of Babel. But here, where the language of God is bestowed upon the people of God. But prior to that, in Acts 2.1, it says, When the day of Pentecost had fully come, it says they were all. All of them, it was 120 of them in an upper room. Uh, they were all, um, and this, by the way, this was all before they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So they all were dwelling together in unity. They were all coming together uh, in prayer. They were all uh, seeking the Lord in his face. And, 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 and how much more, by the way, should we, for those of you who are spirit-filled within the sound of my voice, how much more for those of you who are not only blood-bought and blood-washed and accepted what Jesus did for you as your sin bearer, but on top of that have received that, that special, that second uh, 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 bestowal of grace but the baptism of the Holy Spirit that helps you here on earth. See, Jesus is about here and the Holy Spirit's about here. You've received, how much more should we be united? How much more? But, but they were united even before they received that. It says they were all with one accord. That, that could mean harmony. They were in harmony with each other in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven. So the, the commanded blessing came because they were in one accord in one place. And there came a mighty rushing wind. The whole house was filled where they were sitting. And there appeared to them fire upon their heads. And it sat upon each one of them. And it says they all. Everybody say all. Come on, write all in the chat. They all were filled with the Holy Spirit. So they received fire and they were filled. There was a commanded blessing is the point I'm trying to get you to see because they were together in unity. Even after that, uh, as they left and they went out into the streets, in Acts chapter 2, verse 11, Peter began to preach. And every time I would see that text, I would see Peter standing up in boldness. But what I didn't see until recently is that 11 others were standing with him. Come on, somebody. He was not standing by himself. He was standing with his other brothers and sisters. So not only in the temple courts, but out upon the streets, uh, they were together and they were unified. And later, Paul sees the, the problems that can surface and manifest, not only in the world, but in the church. And he says in 1 Corinthians 10, uh, excuse me, chapter 1, verse 10, he says, I appeal to you, listen to me, dear brothers and sisters, he's talking to the church, by the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, live in harmony, live in accord. This isn't an event. This is a lifestyle with each other. Let there be no divisions in the church. Uh, rather be of one mind. Look at this, and it says united. Unity. How? In thought and purpose. Purpose is related to what God has instructed us to do, what the mandates of God are in Scripture, the Great Commission, the Great Commandment. But the thought part refers to how we apply our tr the truth, how we live it out, our lifestyle. And see, many of us, we're not considering the principles of God and how they apply to our life. We don't care about how it affects other people. We don't care about the influence that we have upon the rest of the world. Yet Jesus has called us to be a salt and a light in the world. And we'll get to that in just a little bit. So listen, God, I'm incentive here. I'm fired up and I don't even have any caffeine in me. God can't bless you, fill you up, uh, put his fire upon your life if it's about me. 
you got to forget about that. It's about we. You can't in marriage, in family, in friendships, in business, in church, have that power and blessing on your life if you don't come into and dwell in unity with one another. Now, Genesis eleven six. basically, I'm going to read from the Amplified real quickly here. It says this. It says, and this was just messing with me. It says, and the Lord said, behold, they are one. He, so God's looking down at the Tower of Babel, and he sees all of them building this tower up into the heavens. See, they wanted to build a tower up to heaven, but God wanted them to be in heaven with them forever. But they had to submit to his ways, not to their ways, because he knew that living uh, by their own rule and living under their own leadership, there'd be chaos. And so he did something about it. But he looked down and he said, behold. They're one. They're unified in, as a people. And they all have the same language. He said, this is only the beginning of what they will do in rebellion against me. And now no evil thing they imagine they can do will be impossible for them. If, let me put it like this. If it will work for people, with, and it does still in the world today. If it will work with people with selfish motives, even as extreme as serving Satan himself, what could, what should, come on somebody, the people of God do with the right motives and with submission and, and dwelling together unified as one blood, one body, one family. You know, recently I was reading um, uh, on a Facebook thread on Connect and there was an interaction there and, and uh, man, God love him, I, I, I don't want to create any conflict for him, but he basically said this little comment, he said, in the election, uh, unity is just going to have to take a back seat. And it just troubled me in my spirit because it goes against everything I see in Scripture. Uh, as I read my Bible, unity can never take a back seat. Unity needs to be in the front row. Come on, everybody. And so I want you to see that as we continue to dialogue and dig into some of the particulars related to our race and relationships. And so what we've said so far, that was my intro. What we've said so far is essentially we're the same, all of us. Regardless of the, the skin uh, color that we have, we learn from the Human Genome Project, and we can also see from Scripture that we are 99.9% .9 the same, that the DNA of us is the same. We are 0.1% different, okay? And so this means that the stuff that has made us different, those distinctives of, uh, of color uh, of skin, of color of hair, of type of hair, of all, all those things, uh, it, it's, it's all superficial, it's all surface. And so in our heart, what we want to do is we want to not let the small things, the 0.1% differences, divide us or create walls around us towards others. We also learned in week one as well as week two that the differences in our human character and even our human ability is not a result of genetics. It's a result of culture which we'll unravel a little more today. This, this is more a result of what's taught to us and how we've been uh, directly and indirectly educated within the environments of which we are a part of. And that is why you can put a black man, for example, in a predominantly, let's say, Hispanic or Latin uh, environment and the types of things and the taste buds and the interests and all of that will be affected by that. And similarly, you can put a white man and you can put them uh, perhaps in a Brazilian environment Environment. And, and that will affect uh, their preferences. It will affect uh, the, the things that they're interested in because of the group, because of the people, because of the environment, because of the things that have been taught to them. In other words, it's not a result of a genetic predisposition. That is simply false. That is simply a lie. And so that is why um, I have begun to, to make this more a reality, but uh, that's why I'm not going to support stereotypes. I don't subscribe to stereotypes and that we place ourselves in or that we place other people in. And, and, and I have uh, family that is Brazilian, so I can, I can touch on this, but I, I don't believe in Brazilian time. Come on, somebody. I don't believe in that, okay? I don't believe that, uh, that I think that's a result of, 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 
you know, of, of environment. That's a, in other words, connect is always for year after year after year after year started on time. And, and so I don't believe in starting an hour late uh, to accommodate that. And so there's not just some gene inside different people groups that causes them to show up late. I know some of you husbands are questioning that right now. And so we'll pray for you. Okay. But when we allow ourselves <laughs> to uh, have a way out, in essence, we're saying that God created us, designed us behind the eight ball in certain things when we label or when we place certain stereotypes on people. And so I just want you to say, I reject that. You should reject that. He didn't create us white, yellow, black, red, and brown. He created us, in essence, all the same, but we just have different shades of how he created us. And we're going to see that in a video in just a few seconds. We know this instinctively. We see this uh, in, the, in the, uh, the, the, the life of children. Look at how young children in their innocence, uncorrupted by the environments and by the conditions and even by the learning that transpires, they play together, they, 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 can, they can share together, they, they, they help one another, and they, don't, they are not affected by that. And so it's not... It's more, it's more a taught thing until we are taught not that w though, we are, though we have certain differences, they're small. And that we shouldn't, because of them, feel superior or inferior. Or, 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 or we shouldn't uh, be taught to look down on someone or feel looked down upon because of, because of this melanin. I'm just going to call it what it is, a melanin lens. I heard a pastor, Pastor George Davis, call it this, the melanin lens. In other words, there are different uh, shades uh, to this exterior. Uh, and, and at different times of the year, the shades change. And, we, and it's based on the melanin. With, we all have it, by the way. We all have a certain amount of melanin within our system. And, but when you see through that lens, uh, it, it's kind of like looking through glasses, all right, so, so these glasses right here have kind of a yellowish lens. Do I look pretty cool? Come on, come on, somebody. Do I look, all right, look okay? All right, you know, like Terminator? No, maybe? Vin Diesel? Whatever works for you. You put something in the chat. I'll check it out later. But, you know, it, this, these particular glasses, when you look through these glasses, I see everything with a certain color. Everything uh, seems to be yellow. And no matter what you tell me the color is, it won't change the way I see things. The, the, the lens that I'm looking through is affecting everything that I see, uh, and, 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 I'll, and, I'll, and I'll go to war over it because of what I see. But then if I take these off and I put another pair of glasses on with more of a silver lens, I'll be back. You know, if you, <laughs> if you, if you see, if you take those off, put on, it's like all of a sudden I'm like, oh my gosh, this looks like you changed your clothes. It looks like you, you, cha you changed externally. You didn't change. I just changed the lens that I'm looking through, it's affected, it's affected me. That And so similar to uh, these glasses, you and I all have a, a melanin lens that we're looking through. And God wants to open our eyes to be able to see through his eyes the world and the, and the people uh, that he created. Can I have an amen? Because when we look through that melanin lens, everything we hear, everything we see is evaluated or based on how much or how little of melanin we have in our bodies. But the reality is the dose of melanin does not change the character of the person, good or bad. Can I have a big amen? And so with the help of God's word, we're going to unlearn some things. We're going to relearn some things. So I want you to pay, a close, pay close attention to this video because sometimes we're separating over very small and very minute details. Check this video out. I think this is going to help you. I hear this one a lot. How can there be so many races in the world if we are all descendants of Adam and Eve? Well, check this out. First off, let's talk about the word race. Sometimes when people use the word, they mean supposed races of people who have evolved at different times, rates, and in different locations. That's not true. Of course, the word race is also a term we use to distinguish between groups with different physical traits, namely skin color. But are there really different races? Take a gander at Acts 17.26 where it is written that God, from one man, made every nation of men. It's clear then that the Bible teaches that there is one race, the human race. The Bible is also clear that all people on the earth 
are descendants of Adam and Eve who were created by God. Check Genesis 126 through 28. Easy enough. God created two people in his image, male and female, and told them to increase in number. So Adam and Eve are mom and dad of the human race. Then their children had children and those children had children and so on and so forth for many generations until, according to Genesis 6, 9, the world's population was reduced to eight people who were protected inside an ark during a global flood. And those eight people later walked off the ark. And according to Genesis 9, 19, from them came the people who were scattered over the earth. Oh, wait a second. What do I mean scattered? Well, jump over to Genesis 11 and let's talk about an event known as the Tower of Babel. Basically, because of the sinful actions of the descendants of Noah, the Lord confused their language and scattered them from there over all the earth. That's pretty clear and concise. Okay, so we've got lots of people who are descendants of the eight folks who came off the ark, and now they have been scattered all over the earth. That explains that we are still one race and that different groups of people ended up in different locations. But how do we get a bunch of different colored people if we are all one race? Well, follow along. This, of course, is a simplified explanation, but the basic principles are true. We all have a pigment in our bodies called melanin, which, depending on different variables, produces different shades of the one main skin color we all possess. Several genes control the amount of melanin produced and thus the variability in the skin shade. In fact, it's easy for one couple to produce a wide range of skin shade variability in just one generation, as we'll see in just a moment. Time for a quick genetics lesson. DNA is the molecule of heredity that is passed from parents to children. A child inherits 23 chromosomes from each parent. Each chromosome pair contains hundreds of genes which regulate the physical development of the child. However, to illustrate basic genetic principles pertaining to the topic, we'll just talk about two genes, the genes that control the production of melanin. So, let capital A and capital B symbolize versions of the gene that code for large amounts of melanin, while little a and little b code for small amounts. Got it? Easy. Check this out. Take a look at the upper left. Let's say dad contributes capital A, capital B genes, and mom contributes capital A, capital B genes as well. Together they will produce a child with capital A, capital A, capital B, and capital B. This is a kid with a lot of melanin, thus he will have very dark skin. Easy to see. Here's the bigger point though. Let's say dad contributes capital A, capital B, and mom contributes little a and little b. Well, the child's skin will be middle brown shade, the combination of capital A, little a, and capital B, little b, which by the way represents a majority of the world's population. Not only that, but if each parent is capital A, little a, capital B, little b, the combinations that could be produced in their children could result in a very wide range of skin shades in just one generation. So. Since Adam and Eve were the first people ever, it makes sense to conclude that God placed in them a combination of genes that could produce all different shades of skin we see. Those same combinations would be present in Noah and the seven other people who boarded the ark. And because God dispersed people at the Tower of Babel, he dispersed the population, thereby isolating gene pools in the different people groups. Over time, different cultures formed in different locations with certain features like skin shade becoming predominant. And here we are today. And since we all go back to Noah and his family, it makes sense that we are all different shades of brown. One race, multiple people groups, just like the Bible teaches. Simplified for sure, but enough said. Okay, enough said, everybody. Enough said. Hopefully that made sense to you. I want to read to you. Look what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I'm going to read from verse 14, reading from the message. It says this. It says, Christ's love has moved me to such extremes. His love has the first and last word in everything we do. He included in everyone... He included everyone in his death so that everyone could also be included in his life. So he's talking about the death and the resurrection, a resurrection life, a far better life than people could ever live on their own. So God didn't just include black people or white people or red people. He included all people, a red and yellow, black and white. They are precious in his sight. He died for everyone. He rose for everyone. And because of that decision, verse 16, we don't evaluate people by what they have or how they look. Come on, can I get an amen out there for that? See, I'm reading something in the Bible that I, I say, and many of you say, we subscribe to. And so if we would, and this decision that Jesus has made to die for all humanity should dictate or should drive our behaviors. And so, the, so it should change everything. So we should love people, whether they're poor or rich, whether they're black, yellow, red, brown, white, whatever they are, skinny, short, tall, large, whatever, it doesn't matter. We don't evaluate people as Christ followers by what they have or how they look. 
Man, this is so good from God's word. And how different would the world be if we looked at the world not through the lens of, of different shades and glasses, but if we looked through them through God's glasses, through God's eyes. We saw them through the lens of the death, burial, and resurrection. We saw them through God's work on the cross. We don't see, we shouldn't see, by the outside first. I'm not saying that we don't see people on the outside. I'm saying we don't see people on the outside first as Christ followers. We're, we are not colorblind, okay? But it's more that we don't evaluate the good, the bad, the better, the worse. Uh, we don't decide whether we're going to hang out with someone or not hang out with someone by what we see on the outside. Are you following me? Like, is everybody with me right now? So I don't, people say, I don't see color, you know, I, I think that's misunderstood sometimes. Of course you see color. It's what you see first. You need to see the inside first. You need to see not what they have or how they look first. If you don't see color, then, you know, if you're, people say, I'm colorblind. Well, I don't want to drive with you when we come to a red light, okay? We'd be in great danger. All right, so unbelievers uh, sometimes are, are, are more prone to do that, and that's understandable. In fact, I heard this quote. It said, racism is the heart of a sinner. It's understandable and even expected. But racism in the heart of a follower of Christ must never be allowed to rest. We're called to a higher standard. We're called to live through a different lens. In fact, the Bible tells us, and I said this earlier, Jesus wants us to be a salt and a light in the world. You know what a salt is? A salt was, it's referring to preserving that which is good. Light is, is referring to eradicating darkness, okay? So God is calling us to preserve the good, keep the things that are good from going bad. God is calling us to be a light. To, to, it's powerful. By the way, light is always more powerful than darkness, and it eradicates darkness. And we must banish it with the truth of God's word. So how do we become a salt and a light? Write this down. If you're taking notes, i got a lot to do in a little bit of time. Write this down. We first must judge one another by the present, not the past. By the present, not the past. Paul said this in Philippians 3.13. He said, of course, uh, friends, I really don't think that I've already won it. The only thing I do, however, is to forget. Everybody say forget. To forget what is behind me and do my best to reach what is ahead. So Paul, a very learned man, a very scholarly man, spoke many languages. The guy was a genius. He's basically saying, I don't care about all that. The thing that I've learned to do well is not all of that learning. The thing I learned to do well is to forget what is behind me, okay? And some of you need to do that. You need to be, uh, you'd be way better off if you could learn this skill of not living in the past, but making sure that you're focused on the present. And some of you, it doesn't even have to apply to racial injustice. It just applies to relationships. Some of you, you're, you're, you're focused on a divorce and you're living in depression and you're, you're focused on that man, what he did in the past, and you're applying it to every man here in the future. And come on, somebody, you need to learn how to get over your past and forget about your past. we got to begin to reach forward. Now, I'm not remotely suggesting that we forget the atrocities of, of, of some of the past. We, we, if we do, we, we're bound to repeat them. And I believe in that wholeheartedly. I, I'm not saying forget the Holocaust and forget slavery and, and, and thank God, you know, even though we were, there, slavery was, a, you know, emanci uh, uh, abolished in 1865, we still have the slavery attitude. I, I, I'm not trying to say we, we overlook those things. I'm suggesting that we stop blaming the person in front of us because of the mistakes of the person behind us. See, that's how we get out of this. Most of you don't know a slave owner. Most of you don't know somebody that put somebody in a gas chamber. Uh, and those are extremes. I understand that. But we'll, if we live in that past, we'll continue to look through the windshield of life with su suspicion, uh, with, uh, with dislike, with distrust, and even in even hatred. So judge the present not the past. Dr. King said this, and we've heard this before. I have a dream that for my little children, we will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. So we're called as Christ followers to get to know people. To How does it begin? It begins one person at a time. It begins one conversation at a time. It begins one decision at a time. 
over time. That's how we'll begin to turn the tide on all of this. And Jesus has provided for us as Christ's followers and he, uh, a solution. And he has, broken, he, has, he has broken the power of the enemy. Ephesians 2.14 says it like this. The Messiah has made things between us that we're now together on this. Both non-Jewish outsiders and Jewish insiders. He tore down the wall we used to, that used to keep us and others at a distance. There was a wall in this time between Jews and non-Jews, insiders and outsiders, interesting language. But verse 16 says, Christ brought us together through this death on the cross. Verse 18, it says, he treated us as equals and he made us equals. So because of what Christ did, all Jews, non-Jews, whites, blacks, reds, browns, yellows, it doesn't matter. He broke down the wall. We are all now equals. That means we, when we go to heaven, we can all go to heaven, the same heaven. We don't go to a black heaven, a white heaven, an Asian heaven, a Brazilian heaven. No, we're all going to the same heaven as one family. So heaven currently is confused because Christians are not tearing down these walls. We're continuing to build them up. And those walls have been torn down because of what Jesus did. And some people hear what I'm saying and they're thinking, yeah, you know, that's, you know, that's the problem. You're a sellout, Pastor D. You're, you're one of them Uncle Toms. You, you need to get woke. I want you to know something. I'm wide awoke, okay? I understand what I'm saying. I'm just living, I'm just trying to get you to, to live with a solution mindset, not rehashing the problems of the past. Are they important? Are they meaningful? Yes, but we have to continue to look forward like Paul and forget what is behind. Number two. If you're still with me, say amen in the chat. Number two, this will go faster. Gravitate towards truth, not racial division. Gravitate towards truth, not racial division. Now, in 1 Corinthians 13, known as the love chapter, it says things like love is patient, love is kind, love is long-suffering, love is self-control. But in verse 6, it says this. A lot of people miss this. It says it does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Let me translate that for you. You might want to write this one down. Love doesn't choose a racial side. It chooses a righteous side. Love doesn't choose a racial side. It chooses a righteous side. Love doesn't pick um, sides in a verbal battle or a media uh, battle or a topic or whatever it, uh, based on racial lines, but based on righteous lines. What am I saying? How do I impact that? Well, wrong is wrong and right is right. Now, if you don't have an absolute standard in your life, we're going to have a lot of problems. I, I, that's another thing that I have to address uh, and you have to address in your Christian experience. Do you have an absolute standard? But wrong is wrong and right is right regardless of the racial dynamic, period. And that has application that's touchy. And I'm going to try to touch on it a little bit. Known to do that. But there have been shootings, for example, uh, this year, years gone by, uh, seems like an increase that have caused an eruption of emotion within our country that seemingly is insurmountable. And I'm not going to attempt to surgically unpack the different ones, first of all, not for time. But you think about, you know, uh, Trayvon Martin and George Floyd and, and, and Breonna Taylor and all these, these things. I mean, you just talk about intensity. But, but these events here have been catalytic for, I believe, the end times. Because the Bible talks about nation will rise against nation. Remember in week one we talked about that, okay? So one of the signs of the end times would be racism. And so I believe it's going to increase in the world, but it should decrease in the church of Jesus Christ, okay? And so uh, suffice it to say that these types of experiences, too many to mention, have created huge division in our country. But what usually happens is there's division over these racial issues. One goes to one side, one goes to one so another side, one goes to one corner, one goes to the other, and, it's, it, and, and they don't gravitate towards truth. See, what I'm trying to get you to see, remember the principle where we need to gravitate towards truth, not towards racial lines. So in most of these scenarios, when they happen, Christians, I'm speaking to you, what happens is it becomes about a white life and a black life, not just a life. Not just a life. Somebody, somebody was murdered. Somebody was killed. It's not about white and black. It's about somebody, a life that was murdered or killed and being cut off too soon or unfortunately. And if I can just share my opinion here, and I'm, I'm introducing this as opinion, okay? And I'm trying to do it carefully and also quickly. But 
Let's go back a little bit, kind of point in case. It's still touchy, though. Back in 1995, 1995, I'm going way back here, okay? The trial of the century, O.J. Simpson's. Uh, allegedly kills his wife, okay? And he's on trial for the murder of his wife. And the, I remember when the verdict was announced. Um, and and I, again, I wasn't, in the, I wasn't in the courtroom. I'm just going by what, what TV and what media had presented. But seemingly, the evidence was overwhelming in strong support of a conviction from the television, but he was acquitted. What was interesting to me was the racial divide because on the streets, the black people were celebrating and in their homes, the whites were angry and upset. And you can see it on TV and the different networks. And I'm trying to just say this is about racial lines. What I'm saying is never choose sides on what right, what's right or wrong, what, what is right or what is wrong based on race. I'm saying Christians must have a different mindset from being pulled to left or right. Touchy. If a white police officer kills a black person, we're outraged. And we should be. And, and, and we march and we protest. But if a black person kills a black person, in some cases, we don't tell anybody. There's kind of this no snitch rule that's out there. I'm trying to get you to see the racial lines that manifest. So does the life of one matter more uh, because it was taken by a white person, or does life, all life, matter? The life matters no what, no matter who is behind the trigger that pulled it, is what I'm trying to get you to see. Please hear my heart here. So, so stop being silent. No matter what the color of the skin, the gender, the nationality, uh, uh, similarly, uh, we, we, we must stop remaining silent in the boardrooms. And because of the good old boy networks, uh, we, don't, we, we can't let certain things happen right in front of us where somebody who's qualified is excluded because of their skin color or because of their gender or because of their nationality. We, we must not be silent in those situations. We must stop taking sides against God by keeping silent in situations like that and allow injustice, remember 1 Corinthians 13, 6, to take place. We must stop putting on those melanin lenses. We must stop putting on those prejudice uh, paradigms. And we need to dig a little deeper. We need to uh, assume we don't know the end of the story. We don't walk in and go, oh, these people and those. We think we got it all sized up because of the past. Has these types of things have happened before, and so they're going to happen again. And do these things make your blood boil sometimes? Sure. But do we throw away God's word and God's ways because of it? I would say no. No, we have to subordinate those emotions and subordinate uh, those assessments and those past experiences and stop assuming that this time is the same as the last time and dig for the truth and, and, pr- and not presume through la- racial lenses. And, and like I said, get all the facts. The Bible tells us that he that judges a matter before he hears it, it's a folly and a shame to you. And so I believe there are situations where there has been police brutality and, and, and sometimes the murder of even just kids in cold blood and it's grievous. But I also believe there have been cases that, 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 that the results could have been different if there had been a fundamental respect for authority. I'm just trying to get you to see there's, there's both sides to this thing. And there are situations that if that person had, had, had done what they were supposed to do, which is respect authority, there could be a totally different scenario in some scenarios, not all. And, and why don't we do that? Because it's just, why don't we want to hear that? Because it's just easier to blame. I just want to say as your pastor, I've taught all my kids to respect authority. I've not taught them just to respect police officers. I've taught them to respect teachers and coaches and their elders because I believe in the principles of authority. Listen, people, if we create a community that that believes and that submits to authority, not based on red, black, yellow, white, whatever, that doesn't hate authority but respects authority, we'd have a different world. We'd have a different community. And that's how it should look in the church of Jesus Christ. That's the kind of church that I'm going to pastor. And so you don't want a society where there isn't authority and where there isn't a respect for authority. There will be mayhem. And so in the end, uh, Dr. King said this also. He said, we'll remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. So I think a secret to this societal problem is that whites need to call out whites. 
And blacks need to call out blacks. And Hispanics need to call out Hispanics. And, and whatever ethnic group, when we see these things that violate God's word, God's truth, we need to call uh, each other out because it will be more successful when the person, the perpetrator, has the same melanin as I do, is calling that person out. I think we can get to the day, maybe in the church of Jesus Christ, where we don't even have to have that sensitivity at all. As I conclude, and I know this has been sensitive for some, and there's a lot of things that are left unsaid, so please come back for the following messages in this series. Let me conclude with this final, final thought. Remember this. There's one body and there's one family. I like to say, from one blood on one mission. See, there isn't a white body, a black body, a yellow body. There isn't a, there's just one. There's just one. There's not going to be a, a white heaven, a black heaven, a, 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 an Asian heaven, a Brazilian heaven. No, there'll, be, there'll always be different cultures, different preferences, different languages, but one body, one body. First Corinthians says it like this, verse 12. Verse 13 of chapter 12. Some of us are Jews. Some of us are Gentiles. Some of us are slaves. Some of us are free. But we've all been baptized into one body. Everybody say that. One body. Type that in the chat. One body by one spirit. And we all share the same spirit. Verse 20 says, we all, what we have is one body and many parts. Uh, verse 25 says, the way God designed our bodies is a model for understanding our lives together as a church. You look to a body to understand how we should work together. And then it says, every part, everybody say, I'm a part of the body. Every part dependent on every other part. The parts we mention and even the parts we don't. All of our parts are important. Everybody, you need to know something. You're a part of the body, one body, and you are important to solving this whole thing so we can be one blood coming together as one. Let me pray for you right wherever you are. If you would just close your eyes, bow your heads, and I want you to think about something as I conclude. In just a minute, you're going to have an opportunity to invite Christ into your life, but I want you to first start with this thought. You know, Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he spoke to his disciples and he said, one of you is going to betray me. One of you is going to betray me. And they all responded unanimously, is it I, Lord? Is it I, Lord? See, as disciples, we shouldn't look around and say, wait, I need, I, so-and-so needs to hear that. I'm going to post this so everybody out there that don't understand this needs to hear this. Listen, your response as a Christ follower should be, is this for me? Is it I, Lord, that have been doing these things? Have there been ways that I've been betraying you and I haven't been living by these principles? If that's you, I just want you to get right with God right now. Maybe the only way for you to get right with God is to come to know God. And so there's a little... There's a little opportunity there where you can raise your hand and say, I want to receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior. When you do, something will happen to you. The walls of hostility, the things that are holes in your heart, the problems that are going on in your life, they all can be resolved because you made this connection right. All the other connections can be made right as well. So I want you to pray this with me right now, if that's you. Say this. Say, Jesus, today I receive by faith, by grace through faith, salvation because of what you did 2,000 years ago. I receive that for me today. Lord, would you make me a new creation? And would you help me to see the world and see myself through a new set of glasses? God glasses, because you've changed me from the inside. I can see people from the inside and not by what they have or how they look. From this point forward, I'm a new person in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen and amen. Come on, let's give the Lord a big hand clap for his word, for lives being changed, for eyes being open, and for us coming together in unity. God bless you guys. I will see you again on the Lord's day. Amen.